Hello, American Downhiller fans, and welcome to the American Downhiller podcast, episode 10, presented by SkiRacing.com. Today, we have a very special guest, the strong, the fast, the committed, the positive, and unfortunately, recently injured Breezy Johnson. Before last week's crash in Cortina, she was second in the downhill standings. We will talk to her about her injury, missing the Olympics, but also how about, about how she has committed her life to being the strongest, most committed, and fastest skier on the women's circuit. Hi, everyone. I'm Doug Lewis, two-time Olympic downhiller and raced with the U.S. ski team from 1980 to 1988. My ski heroes were Franz Klammer, Phil Mayer, and Ingemar Stenmark. All were larger than life and showed me what total commitment to the sport of skiing looked like, and I tried to emulate them. Joining me are two of the fastest American downhillers in our history. Founder of the American Downhillers, Marco Sullivan, a four-time Olympian who has a record 105 downhill starts on the World Cup. Marco, who were your ski racing heroes growing up and how did they motivate you? A uh, hero for me is right on the other side of the screen, Darren Ralves and uh, Kyle Rasmussen, American boys from the West Coast. And they were fast when I was coming up. But always good to have those heroes. Nice. And Darren Rawls, winner of 12 World Cups, his first World Cup wins coming back to back in Kvitfell, uh, way back when. Darren, who were your ski racing heroes growing up and how did they motivate you? Uh, you know, growing up was Gunther Mater, an Austrian. He killed it in downhill, Super GGS, even skied some good slalom, which I wasn't really interested in. But, you know, just his attitude, he seemed like a cool guy. Um, you know, he had the full package. So that was the guy I was looking at through my whole career coming up uh, until I started racing against him, which is, which is pretty awesome as well. Racing yeah, it's against pretty, the idol. It's pretty cool when you get to race against the idol. When I won the bronze medal in fifth place, standing below me was Franz Klammer. I was like, bigger, it was the best day of my life. Anyway, now let's bring in our special guest, Breezy Johnson. She's from Jackson, Wyoming seventh in the 2018 Olympic downhill, only 68 starts in her career and already seven podiums, four thirds. And the last three downhills, she was second each time, as close as two tenths of a second from her first win. Breezy has big goals and she's not afraid to share them, which I love. Breezy, welcome to the podcast. Where are you located right now? Um, I am in Vail, Colorado right now, um, getting surgery on Thursday. I'm not exactly sure when this will come out, but that's in just a few days. So that's where I am right now. And I guess to follow everybody else's thread on who their skiing idols were, my skiing idols growing up were Anya Pearson, obviously amazing at all five events. She had her amazing whale slide that I thought was super cool. And then Lindsey Vaughn, obviously amazing American downhiller from the States, just greatest of all time. Can't really argue with that. Do you have like maybe a whale slide or something different uh, ready for when you take your first win? I might have something in my head that I've <laughs> thought about. A little Jackson, Wyoming hit or something. That would be cool. You have to wait and see, I guess. I hope I one day make it there. Are you hiding like a big uh, belt buckle underneath your suit? Just to actually, whip that thing out. Actually, that I can do a standing backflip with my skis on, obviously. That takes oh, Didier, yeah, no problem. That takes Didier Kush to a whole new level. <laughs> All right, so you're in Vail. Can you give us an update on your crash, your prognosis, and what's next for your recovery? Um. Yeah. So obviously, I you know crashed in. Well. First, it kind of somewhat started with my crash in Paso San Pellegrino um, earlier this month. Um, I, you know, there was some damage to my knee at that point, not too big of a deal, um, but it was definitely like, oh, well, you're going to need to clean up at the end of the season kind of thing. And, um, you know, kept skiing and then obviously went really big off of the Duca jump, which is a famous jump in Cortina. It's a very flat jump. And so when it's big, it's big and I immediately went off and was like oh you kind of see me like extend because I was like I need all of my absorption and didn't have it immediately on landing I just felt it kind of crack in there which was a big chunk of cartilage um so yeah they're gonna go in and 
um, replace that with like a, actually a piece of like cadaver onto the femur. Um, and then hopefully that will take and, you know, be great. And, um, you know, I obviously, you know, they offered, like, they were like, you could maybe try to, you know, stick this all back together and ski at the Olympics. But, um, you know, I was, I was in a lot of pain. I wasn't, it wasn't feeling, you know, the best. And then, um, I knew that if I did it after the Olympics, then it would be really hard to come back for next season. And so I, you know, had to make the decision that, um, you know, one, one race, even if it is the Olympics, that's maybe not going to go great. And you're just kind of hoping your body holds together isn't worth the whole season. So, um, yeah, my goal right now is to be back for next year. Um, I don't know if they're going to do those crazy Zermatt world cups, but probably won't make it back for that, but, um, hopefully be back by Lake Louise. Yeah, Breezy. Um, we all know how much this hurts and huge. I mean, really tough decision. You're obviously crushing it all year and, you know, I mean, it's part of life. Unfortunately, you know, this went wrong and, um, bad timing, but it was sure fun watching it all season. You, you ski with a lot of heart and grit and super strong. I remember reaching out to you last year, kind of, you know, asking why you think you're, you're all of a sudden just like so consistent and fast. And, and uh, your, your reply was being so confident in yourself because of how hard you work and knowing that you could just like put so much on the line and, and take a lot of risk. And it's fun watching you ski. I mean, that's, that's true downhill right there. So I think you're making the right call. It, you know, ski racing is a dangerous sport. Downhill is definitely a dangerous sport, as I think we all know. Um, and, you know, timing sometimes sucks. But, um, you know, luckily, like, you know, orthopedics has improved greatly since even you guys were competing. Um, and, you know, so that's that's really great. And people's careers are lasting longer. So, you know, there's still, there's still a lot left on the table. Like, luckily we're not a sport where people retire at, you know, 21, 22, that would, um, that would definitely be unfortunate, you know? What can you take, you've been injured before, what can you take from your earlier injuries and recoveries to make this one go as well as it can? What did you learn? Um, yeah, I mean, I've learned a lot, I think over the last few injuries, like, you know, there's certain things, um, you know, about my body that I've learned. And, um, you know, also like, I've been lucky to have, you know, a really great crew around me. Um, so, you know, after my first injury, we, you know, we were kind of testing the waters. And then the second one, we were able to kind of dial in and we really threw, you know, everything at the wall to see what stuck. And, um, you know, at this point, I think that there's, you know, a lot that we have kind of available to us and just like, you know, sports science, like luckily, like my trainer, he just like, you know, he's like kind of a nerd. And so he reads all kinds of articles. So, you know, we're, we do all kinds of stuff, you know, between like the obvious, which is like blood flow restriction and things like that, that a lot of people have heard of to like, you know, eccentric overload training on like your good leg that is supposed to like, you know, we found um, to some degree, like in my last injury, like helps um, kind of keep the other leg stronger um, because your body like doesn't, it doesn't want to be super imbalanced. So um, yeah, we found that that, that kind of helped things. And so um, there's stuff like that and nutrition and things like that, that we've figured out over time for sure. Um, but you know, also like, I think just in general, like coming back from all the injuries, like it makes you really hungry and it makes you want to seize every day. And that's, um, something that you, you know, you can easily sit, sit back in downhill course and like chill out and, you know, but when you, you know, when you have that fire, because it's been gone, like, you're like, I am going to ski this line. Like I'm you know, and you need to have that commitment and you need to have a reason to have that commitment. So, um, I think that that's kind of the goal and yeah. I think you touched on something, sorry, real quick on training, which is super important. When I had my hip injury on the right side, I did a lot of work on my left 
and I really felt, I don't know what you call it, you know, but you you said your fat, your body will naturally catch up. And so if you can't be using one side of your, your, your body, use the other side and neurologically that kind of helps like fire everything. And, and I think you do recover a lot quicker. It's good for your head too, I think. Right. It's nice to be able to just smash something, you know, just get after feel a pump on one leg when you used to get them both going, but I think mentally it helps quite a bit. And that's a, a big part of the process of healing. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I'm not like a big person to like sit around, like I'm good kind of when I'm moving, like I've been struggling this last week. Cause I'm like, well, I've, I have been able to like get back and like be doing some workouts and stuff, which is really good for me, but like sitting around, like waiting, like I want to be moving forward. And so, you know, it's good to like be in the gym doing stuff and like feeling strong because that's just what we're so used to. Like, it's like, feeling like our bodies can do a lot and you're you can still do a lot on one leg and sometimes like you know that isn't everything but it's sometimes enough so last question on the injury and i have to ask just think about talking to u14s what advice for a u14 who gets hurt and has to miss that big event like how what's your advice to them how are you dealing with it well i think you know the like for me, it's always about moving forward and it's always about maximizing whatever situation you're in. So, you know, I think like one of the interesting things for me was that like when I, when I raced my first world cup, I had this like moment where I was like, literally everything that I've ever done, like every accomplishment that I've ever made was to get to this point. And now like the slate's totally wiped clean like you have this opportunity and you either seize on it or you don't and like whether or not you were world junior champion or you won jos when you were 14 or whatever doesn't matter in the end all that matters is that you get to the world cup and you ski well at the world cup like you know you have there are athletes who are at the world cup you know i'm not a world junior champion or whatever and like on the screen it says like world junior champion or whatever you know 2015 and it's like sick but like personally I would rather have like seven world cup medals like so that's just like you know like something to remember is like the big picture that like ultimately it matters how hard you work so that you can reach that next level and like whether or not you make JOs whether or not you you know do well this season or whatever it matters how you are in the long term not how you are in the short term. So as long as you're kind of maximizing and, you know, moving yourself forward, regardless of whatever circumstances you're in, then you're in a good path. All right, we're moving on. We got to talk about Goja. Talk about your relationship with her. Is there a rivalry? If so, describe it. Is it positive? Is it motivational? Is it distracting? Because it seems like you guys are right there and it's really cool to watch. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, Goja's the best downhiller in the world right now. Um, she, you know, she's been she's been crushing, you know, for the past year and a half. Although, of course, like it's you know, four years ago wasn't that long ago, and she was crushing back then too. I think, um, you know, she has been a very interesting figure on the World Cup for a really long time. She has, you know, big personality. Uh, you know, she. I, she has this really funny, like, bull, I call it her bulldog walk. She like walks around in the, in the hospitality and she kind of like sticks her chest out or whatever. And like, um, and I'm like, to me, it just kind of makes me laugh, but like, you know, I love that she, you know, she just, you know, she, she has this very distinct personality and, um, you know, she embraces that. And, throws down obviously on the course and has a very distinct skiing style um you know incredible risk very straight line um you know pulling off with a lot of mistakes um and um but she you know she's been making it work and it's been very impressive to see um and so yeah I mean I think I don't you know I don't know that she would really consider us rivals I guess because I you know I've never beat her like you know at these top levels but um I think she you know you've definitely seen like when she's you know talking to me in Valdez or whatever that um 
you know, it's, she definitely feels me knocking on the door and, um, you know, obviously, you know, I just got hurt. She just got hurt. Um, you know, it's a classic thing to kind of not say everything that's wrong with you. For example, when I got hurt on January 8th, I, you know, didn't mention that, like, you know, I had some internal knee damage at that point. And, um, you know, what she, what the Italian Federation and her have admitted to is wrong in her knee. It honestly, I'm like, if it's worse than that, that's kind of terrifying, but you know, there hasn't been a repeat women's downhill champion since like Katya Kostner in 94 and 98. I don't really know if I'm pronouncing that name correctly. It's older Kostner. Yeah. Um, but you know, like, so it's a, it's a big deal and, um, you know, so we'll see what happens, but, you know, I definitely think that, um, her mentality is, is very admirable and she's an incredible, um, champion and competitor. Um, so yeah, but you know, she's, she's been super supportive of me. I mean, I remember talking to her like after my first injury, when I was like kind of a nobody and she was, you know, very kind to me and, um, things like that. So I think she, she has a good heart. So does she bring out the best in you? Do you think? Um, yeah, I mean, I think I've learned a lot from, you know, watching her and chasing her and, you know, trying to figure out, you know, where to, where to gain time. Um, it's funny because, you know, her strengths and my strengths, like, you know, I always like thought I was a good glider and things like that. And then she's like a better glider than me. And now I'm like, am I like the technical skier in this duo? Like, this is weird. Um, but you know, it like gives me something kind of to watch and like, you know, get even better at things that, you know, I always thought I was really good at. So, um, yeah, she's, um, yeah, got very impressive skills and it's interesting to see, you know, the trajectory of her career. Cause I think a lot of people after like her foot injury in 2019 and then 2020 kind of wrote her off. Um, and then she really charged back last season um which is interesting you know because for a long time like you know there were people who peaked but the double peak is a little more unusual for sure taking that rivalry thing to the next level I mean is are you ever in the start thinking about beating her are you always just thinking about your run and how you can maximize your own speed I mean, I think that our styles are very different. So I definitely, you know, have, there are times when I've watched her and I'm like, if I do that, like, I'm going to kill myself. And, you know, I know I just got injured, but I've like actually been trying to limit my risk in this sport somewhat, which, you know, Go just says she is, but personally watching her, I don't see that. And that's like, you know, so I'm like, you know, I'm going to do my thing and like, trust, you know, my skills for sure. Um, but you know, I definitely like, you know, will, you know, if there's time or whatever, sometimes I'll watch her. Sometimes I don't, because I'm like, I don't want to like get this in my head because I'm like, I like, sometimes I'm like, I don't know that I can pull off that straight line. Like, I don't know if that's wise. Back in my day, we had a lot of, you know, and, and maybe it's just because of COVID, but you know, all the bibs, everybody's showing the bibs in front of the camera. In our, my day, we had bib draws, you know, we'd all get together. And there's definitely some guys who are flexing, you know, um, their confidence. And, like, you got the Austrians mostly and some of the Norwegians. But as Goja, you said she's walking around or puffing her chest out in the hospitality area. Is she trying to flex her, like, um, just her status a little more on you, especially because you're kind of the one knocking on the door? Or do you see her kind of, like, I mean, she seems really respectful, like you said, and like got to give that to her. She's a true, like all around athlete champion. And, um, you know, I just, my experience, she's an awesome girl, um, you know, skis hard, but is, is just like a respectful athlete to the others. That's why we see. So I'm just interested though, is there like a time where you find, kind of felt like, damn, she's trying to really like get in my head right now. No, I don't think that she's like trying to get in people's heads. Like I, I, I usually say that like, 
in my experience the like telltale sign of somebody who's trying to get in other people's heads is when they start stealing people's bib numbers um so like you know for example there were certain people that Lindsay didn't like and when she got higher than them on the start list she would take the bib number that they wanted um you know and there are like you know Goja has has kind of like she kind of moves around a little bit but she really she likes number five quite a bit and she, there's a number of girls in those kind of second and third slots who really like number seven and she's she has not been trying to play mind games with them by stealing number seven so I think that that's to me like the telltale sign like you'll see it like if you know if there's a if if there's like a dude that starts stealing number 11 I'll be like that guy's trying to get in Kilda's head because Kilda likes number 11. How about Um, you what's your number? Um I like seven a lot I like five I like nine too I don't know I haven't like totally picked a number I think I gotta start winning and then I'll be like oh this is my lucky one (laughs) but um yeah, I mean, it, in, in Lake Louise, it was funny because I was like the fourth pick or whatever. So I ended up with bib three in the in the first race and then did well. And then I think somehow like that got into the other girls' heads. And so then they picked three and I got nine, which I wanted more anyway, which I thought was funny. <laughs> so besides Goja, who you sometimes want to watch and sometimes don't, who is who are the racers? Uh, that you watch on video like I gotta see what she's doing um so in super g like in downhill a lot like obviously we watch like from the training runs and stuff but I I generally don't try to watch anybody before the race really unless there's something weird going on um so obviously like training runs like I watch a lot of people I watch Kira Vidle I think is a is an excellent skier um and um you know I watch sometimes Stephen Hoffer like has very the Austrians always have interesting lines um their coaches are always kind of playing around and doing interesting things um you know as well as obviously Goja I don't really watch Corinne that much because Corinne is just in the past few years she's just not a training run skier at all she has this amazing ability to be like 15th in the training run and you're like there's no chance and then she just like comes back and is on the podium for the race which um is props to her because um that's that's definitely hard to do just even like confidence wise like you know you're like sixth and you're like oh can I like pull this off and but she's just like oh cool like I sucked and now I'm like I'm and just gonna like figure it out and because also like when you're like that far out when you you know you're talking about going like two seconds faster in the race like because you already increased by a second or a second and a half speed just like if you're winning race train run to race so she's in like two and a half seconds or whatever from train run to race and that's just like things are flying at you when you're going that much faster in the race so they have points a little bit too same way yeah yeah he does that I don't know maybe it's a Swiss thing um yeah you pull it off yeah for sure I mean on the men's tour I feel like I mean you guys could talk to this more but I feel like there's a lot more kind of like holding things back before race day although I don't I mean you guys have such high speeds so I don't really know how like to me it seems like you would want to be like a little bit like closer to race speed but maybe that risk is just too high I don't think it's on purpose. A lot of times some, some guys just have that game day flair, you know, maybe, maybe yeah. it's more of a guy thing. I don't know. No, I mean, there's definitely that on the women's side too. Like you watch, like, I mean, you know, every year you come in and you watch like, especially the first race of the year, but like kind of anywhere you just like watch the first train run and you're like, really? Like these are the best girls in the world. Like, Oh, like we did not ski well as a collective group today. And then you watch race and you're like, oh no, there it is. That's no, like on those, on those train runs, Breezy, are you guys watching a lot of like side by side or do you have a, a use in the video for like shadowing? We mostly do side by sides because our coaches don't use tripods. Um, it's 
it's kind of depends. Like you definitely, you know, our coaches always put together like the best, the best splits, you know, in every training run and race. And they shoot those out like via tech. So you kind of get to see that. And then, um, and so you kind of have like an idea of what's going on. Um, but also that like, you know, kind of like to, you know, Corinne's point, like it's always like interesting. Like if I sometimes like, I'll be like, Ooh, like if I did pretty well in the training run, but then avoided being on the best splits, I'm like, mm, when like, didn't not teaching anyone anything, <laughs> but still like staying like fast and like with it for the most part. So right now, because of retirements, uh, you are the leader of this women's speed team. What did you learn from Vaughn and Ross and McKennis when they were the leaders? Uh, what do you, what did you learn from them that you can now help run this team as the leader? Well, I mean, you know, I was super blessed, like, you know, you know, Marco, like, I feel like you guys had this, like when, when you guys were like on your men's a game in like the late, like 2009 era or whatever, but like, you know, we had, you know, Stacy cook, we had Alice McKinnis, we had Loren, we had Lindsay, we had Julia a little bit. And like, everyone was the best at something. So we had like Stacy, I thought was like, you know, probably the best fighter in the world you know, Alice McKinnis, I thought had like the best transition in the world. Like she's really smooth ski to ski. Loren has, I think has the best ability of like technical, like laying it over skills. And then Lindsay obviously had so many talents that she was the best at. Um, and so that was like really cool. I feel like I sort of feel bad because I feel like the, the young girls growing up, like don't totally have that, but, um, you know, one thing that was really cool, like for me moving up onto World Cup was just like the kind of confidence and like relaxedness of the group that it was just like, we're good. Like we're really good skiers and we're not like worried about like teaching you things. And like, because the reality is, is like, if we all work together and like, you might beat me like one day or whatever, but like, that means that I moved down one position, but we're both going to beat 10 more Europeans. And so it's way better, like in the end. And that was something, you know, that, you know, we're just trying to like, you know, it's like, you know, be confident, be chill, like, but like, and like, don't feel like, you know, we're going head to head. Like it's hard. It's a little bit harder right now because there are some girls who are having to kind of compete for spots weekend to weekend um for downhill and super g races and um you know i didn't have that coming in but um you know i think you know hopefully going forward we can kind of you know get everyone in that kind of more relaxed like you know we're just doing our thing and we're just learning our craft i guess but nice so you you talked about you know their technical at attributes that they were good at what what mentally do did they bring to you to help you make that jump from dreamer to you are now one of the best yeah well part of it is like that that just kind of like relaxed confidence or whatever that like you know like like I remember I came in and they were like talking and they were like oh like when we go to world champs this year or whatever and I was like you guys are sure you're gonna go to world champs like really like like we're confident on that kind of thing because like even when you're like a junior like even you're, you're like the best junior in the world and you're like I don't know if I'm gonna go to world juniors like I don't know if this is gonna happen and then you know and so that just kind of like you know, I think confidence is like one of the biggest like attributes that you need in order to ski fast, because if you're not confident, like you're inevitably not skiing at a hundred percent of your potential. And, you know, so if you're like really not confident, maybe you're skiing at 75 or 60% of your potential, like you're losing a lot of time on that. Whereas like, if you're confident, like you're skiing at a hundred percent and that's, like that just moves you, you know, so much farther forward than like, if you try to build like your base up enough that 60% is my 95%, like, you know, you have a long ways to go. Um, so that's, that was like one thing. And like, you know, 
obviously like you had like Lindsay who like, you know, she was like, you know, if you want to, if you take my knee out with a baseball bat, if you break my leg, if you do this, like I know how to win. And like, you know, she kind of learned, you know, she knew the tracks. They all knew the tracks really well and they knew how to win on all of them and they knew how to ski fast. And that's, um, you know, definitely something that's, um, you know, trying to instill in the younger generation, especially when like some of them are like, well, I, you know, haven't really watched ski racing. Like, and I'm like, you know, okay, we got to watch ski racing because like, if you're going to go to Cortina and you're going to ski well, like you need to like have watched it a bunch. Like you learn so much. Like I still go back and, you know, watch, you know, Lindsay Vaughn and on the Tofana from 2007, because like, you know, she skied sick, (laughs) like, you know, yeah, the skis have changed and things like that, but you know, so that's like, you know, one of the big things that like, you know, trying to work with, with those girls is like, we need to, we need to watch some ski racing. We need, because like, if you're just looking at the best skiers right now, you're looking at, you know, three, four, maybe five really good skiers. But if you go back in time, you've got, you know, you've got, you know, 25, 30, like, and you have, you know, also you have different like body types and stuff, which is really important to me. Like, you know, I was always looking at like, you know, Ilka when she was at the top of her game, Lindsay at the top of her game, like, because those girls had similar body types to me. But then you look at like an Alex Wilkinson, I'm like, watch Goot, like go back, watch on a bite because like, they're more your like body types. Like, don't try to emulate like me and Goja. Like, that's really hard for you to do because like your strong suits are, you know, not the same. Yeah. That's cool to hear that you're kind of like helping direct, you know, some of these younger athletes and, you know, just, you have so much to pass on, but you've learned, you obviously learned a lot from the other girls, my team ahead of you. So just keep that train going, keep helping each other out. And I think collectively once momentum really starts rolling, the other girls start catching up to your speed. It's just going to make you better too. Right. So it's nice to have some teammates that are fast. Yeah, for sure. I mean, Lindsay, you know, like I said, like, you know, this wasn't that long ago, like five years ago, it's like, you know, Lindsay still had like, you know, Loren and Alice to look at who were like the best in the world at, you know, specific parts of ski racing. Like, yeah, they weren't winning every race, but, you know, they were really good at what they were good at. And so, you know, that still like allowed Lindsay to learn. And so I think, you know, I think it is, it is cool watching, you know, watching the girls get, you know, older and better and, um, kind of, you know, figuring, figuring things out because they, um, definitely have their own, their own kind of talents that they're, you know, just, they're just starting to like figure out how to use them and figure out when, um, when they need them and how to use them. So. Marco, what do you got, man? You've been kind of quiet, dude. (laughs) I'm enjoying listening to Breezy chat it up but uh there's one thing you mentioned earlier like uh in the sport you know we all have a reason to take the risk and send it down the hill um moving forward like recovering from your injury what's your what's going to get get you out of bed in the morning like would you rather do you look toward like winning a world cup or winning the overall or winning the olympic gold or what what's like your ultimate dream in ski racing I mean, obviously, like, you know, all those things are amazing. I think, you know, I, you know, I grew up like we were avid fans of the sport, like, you know, and so, you know, I always like, I always really dreamed of like winning Crystal Globes. Like, I think, you know, the world champs, like, and the Olympics even like, you know, I didn't, you know, I was watching like, you know, I was watching every weekend of ski racing and then they just like gave out these different medals. And like, I, you know, I, for a long time thought that the medals that they give out at world championships are just like the medals they give out at every world cup. I like, <laughs> did not understand the difference at all. Um, so yeah. So, you know, I definitely, um, you know, I want to win, I want to win the globe um you know of course like world championships next season are on my brain um you know and um you know a 
eventually, like I definitely want to want to come back in 26, um, you know, and go for that, go for that gold medal. Um, it's definitely going to be interesting doing it on the same hill that ended this uh, Olympic journey. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> um, but, you know, hopefully that Duke of jump is a little smaller that time. <laughs> You'll have it dialed by then, that's for yeah. sure. <laughs> Talking about re your return, we know you're going to get back physically fit. We know you're going to come back strong. But what's that? You've been on the podium seven times, three times second. What's that one thing or is there two things that you need to do or to solve to get you on the top of that podium? Um, I mean, I think, you know, for me, like a lot of, you know, a lot of it has been kind of, you know, specific specific points where I'm not, I'm not generating as much speed as like Sophia. And so, um, you know, like last, last spring, you know, me and the coaches kind of like put together, like we put together kind of a list of like, okay, like on these roles and like on this thing. And, you know, like these are kind of points that I struggle. So I think a lot of it's just cleaning that up and, um, you know, I think some of it too is just, you know, just being patient. I mean, a lot of, uh, you know, given like, given that I've been injured a number of times, like a lot of these tracks I've only been on, you know, three times maybe, which is, um, you know, pretty, pretty rookie level, um, you know, compared to like Lindsay who'd been on like, we whatever, like 25 times or whatever the hell it was, but, um, so, so some of it's, some of it's that and, um, you know, working through and, and, you know, finding kind of, you know, those small, those small advantages. Um, but I, so I think, you know, the thing, you know, even before, before Christmas was like, well, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Like, I don't want to start like trying to copy Goja and then like going super straight and like hitting a net and, you know, blowing up. Um, because it's, you know, the truth is, it's really hard to win a title. Like you definitely can win a title when you, you know, crash out in a race or whatever, but it's really hard to win a title when you're blowing out a lot and, um, you know, and making big mistakes and things like that. So, um, you know, I, I feel in many ways, like my skiing was getting to a, you know, consistently fast level, um, that was, um, safe. And, you know, I just, you know, this sport is dangerous. And I kind of feel like some of it, you know, they were just kind of freak accidents. Do you, sorry, did you uh, increase your volume of GS skiing last uh, prep period coming this season? Is that something that you focused on locks? I just feel like, I mean, there's a lot of turns now. It's technical. For me, it helped me a ton skiing a lot of GS for speed. So, I mean, is that something you're focusing on a little bit or? And did you do put a lot more time into it last year coming to this? Yeah, season? I think we actually, we sort of spent less time on it last year because COVID meant that we spent a lot of time on GS. But the problem was, was that a lot of it was low quality GS, like skiing GS on hood when it hasn't frozen overnight, not really like maybe going to get you better. So yeah, we, you know, we have been, um, you know, working on, on GS and stuff like that. I think, um, that, you know, is definitely something that will, I mean, inevitably with, with injury and coming back and you spend, you know, a little more time on the technical, the technical side, um, and just trying to, you know, trying to work with the coaches. I think, you know, we have spent, like from when I started on the speed team to now we spend a lot more time racing uh, training super G, which I think is like really good. Like I basically think like in my personal view, like I'm like, you train downhill to run in downhill skis and like anything beyond that requirement is like unnecessary because super G gets you better at downhill and better at super G. So you're getting like a two for one whereas downhill helps your super G less in my experience. So we've been doing a lot of super G um, and um, it'll be interesting to see with, you know, hopefully being able to get into South America, who knows what's going to happen with that. 
um, where things where things go for sure. But well, you better show up for a little American downhiller camp this year, right, Marco? You're I've never been reading. invited. <laughs> You're on the way. Have you? That'd be so rad. For sure. Me and you both, Brazy. I, I can't right. guarantee that I will be skiing at that point, so it might be just. We need you to teach the kids this stuff, which you have the most powerful of. We love it. I can, we can, we can pull out my CD kit and we can watch my DVD races of yeah. Argentina in 2007 that my dad took on a VHS tape and then turned into a CD. So if anyone has better versions of those, but yeah. I think it's awesome that you're like a student of the sport and you've been watching forever. I think that's kind of rare these days. So that's pretty cool. You know, the history and you know, like how cool it is to, run all these amazing tracks and just keeping it going it's awesome yeah but don't think you need all these runs down it i mean you just you got it going on and you could just show up now next year and spank i mean just look at guys like i mean the guy side marco odermott what he's doing now you know jumping a downhill and being super competitive it's first time in kitsville this this season and you get second he, he would have won Ralph's, I actually looked on the fifth site today. That was the second time in Kitzbühel. I lied to you yesterday. Oh, oh man, yeah. <laughs> well, just you look at that, you gave me that bad at, info, Marco. Thanks for correcting that. Well, just <laughs> look at Kilda. He blew out his knee in January last year, and he wins Kitzbühel. So, anything's possible with enough work. All right, we've had we've had uh, Breezy on for over forty five minutes. So, our last question: We're going to put you on the spot. Your I we had you on the medal stand for. Uh, China, but your picks for gold, silver, and bronze in Beijing and the downhill in for the women. Ooh, okay. I mean, this is tough. I think, I think a lot of it hinges on where Goja's actually at because, you know, if Goja gets herself together, like sh there's no question she'll, she'll destroy everyone else, I think um you know in some ways like it's lucky that she had i think it's a left or a right no oh it's unlucky that she had a right knee injury because the course is all right footers so fun fact um which is unusual also for world cup mostly we have left footers um so i think if she pulls herself together then i think she's got the gold if she doesn't then i feel like corinne Suter is the person who sneaks in to grab those things she did it last year at world champs and i wouldn't be surprised if she does it again the track's pretty technical so i think you know lara may be in there um although she's been pretty tired so um, I think the kind of four for my medal stand is Goja, if she's good, Corinne, Lara Goot, and then Ramona Siebenhofer, I think has been turning it on. It'll be interesting to see. I know last year she struggled intermittently with the Fishers. So it'll be interesting to see if the Fishers are running. Um, it'll be interesting to see if the head skis are running too. Um, but I are think- Are Atomic always running? The Atomics have been really fast lately. That's, I mean. What about, what about Esther? What do you think about Esther? Esther? Esther, that's a sneaky one. Esther could definitely be on the podium. Um, and I think like the snowboard events are first. So she'll definitely be running, I think all of the speed events. So um, Esther, Esther is definitely a dark horse, although she's been skiing well this year, but um, not not as well as she was I feel like her in like 2019 2020 she was skiing she was skiing really well but yeah and I think the super g is going to be super interesting too because um you know it is quite a technical track um but and the Italians have been dicing so I think it's definitely it's a little bit between I could see Curtoni skiing really well it, it Part of it reminds me a little bit of Vanska, which is where she got that downhill victory. So she's dark horse. Um, and then the other dark, the other dark horse for the downhill that I forgot to mention is Nadia Delago, one of the Delago sisters. She's on Atomics. So if the Atomics are running, 
which they have been on that cold, dry snow this year. Um, could be, could be interesting to see. But. Hey, a special thanks to Breezy for sharing your story, thoughts, and opinions with us. And good luck with your recovery and return to World Cup next season. We all believe in you and that you will raise that downhill globe high at some point in your career. Work hard and keep us posted. Thanks also to Marco and Darren. And thanks everybody for watching and listening to our American Downhiller podcast. If you liked it, spread the word, share with your friends, post it, tell your coaches, teammates, and club. You can find us in audio form either on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Just search American Downhiller podcast and our video version exclusively on ski racing. Dot com. It also helps a ton if you subscribe and also give us a great rating if you like the podcast. Looking forward to our next podcast. We will give you our thoughts on the Olympic downhill in Beijing, what happened in the men's course, who was fast, who was slow, and why. We will also answer some of your questions. If you have a question, email us at info at americandownhiller.com. Don't forget to watch the Olympic downhill on Sunday, February 6th. That's Saturday in the U.S., or the women's downhill, which is on February 15th, February 14th in the US. We could have our third ever American downhiller champion to join Billy Johnson and Tommy Moe as Olympic champions. Thanks and always remember, ski fast, take chances.